He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. Hi, Stephen Price here. Just a warning, this podcast contains violence and quite a bit of bad language, so take care of yourself while you're listening. There's a quote from Errol Morris, the documentary maker, that keeps coming back to me. He said, You can escape from a prison, but how can you escape from a convincing story? I'm going to tell you a story about a man called David Little. It's a true story. Well, most of it is. And it's a story that David Little has fought for years to escape. My name's Stephen Price, and I've been following David Little's story for five years. I'm a lawyer, but I'm also a journalist, and I wanted to meet him. I saw him in his lawyer's office in 2017. He's slight for a builder, but he's wiry. He has graying hair and an angular face, and he was watching me with what I thought was a mixture of suspicion and hope. The look of someone who wants you to believe him, but isn't sure you will. He was very polite to me and rather guarded, as you would be when you're waiting for your trial, except about one thing. He was furious about how he'd been treated. He wanted everyone to know his story. He wanted it exposed. And I wanted to tell it, because it seems to me that his story tells us a lot about the extraordinary tactics of the police, the workings of the courts, the slipperiness of justice, and the power of a story. And because every time I tell anyone about it, at a dinner or over a drink, their eyes get wider and their eyebrows get higher and their jaws get lower. And they say, that's a great story. Because David Little has been accused of murder. And his main accuser is himself. David Little's story starts with a knock on his door. It's March 2014. John Key's Prime Minister. Disappointed, shocked and horrified of a proper... The Lego movie has just been released. That idea is just the worst. Prince William and Kate are about to visit New Zealand. Tēnā kutu, katoa. <laughs> and Lord is hitting the charts. I've never seen a diamond in the flesh. David Little's at his home in the little town of Halcombe near Palmerston North when he hears the knock. He answers the door and what happens next leads to the best day of his life and also the worst. And so one day uh, two young women turned up on his front door and said, oh hi, um, we're conducting a survey. That's the voice of Christopher Stevenson who heads up David Little's defence team. David wasn't interested in the survey. He didn't really want to talk about his views on local internet connection. He's about to send them away, but then they tell him something that changes his mind. If he takes the survey, he'll go into a drawer for a prize. If you win, you get a deep-sea fishing trip. A fishing trip? David's hooked. He loves fishing. He once won a prize in a fishing competition and got his picture in the paper. So he completes the survey. Surprise, surprise, he wins the competition and, and that's how it all begins. It's some welcome good news. Life has been hard for David recently. He seriously injured his shoulder a few years ago. Needed surgery. That set his building work back. Around then, his best friend, Brett Hall, disappeared. Probably killed. We'll get into just how he disappeared later. David wasn't just worried that his mate was gone. It was about to get much, much worse. Because in the midst of all this, the police turned their spotlight on him. David Little became a prime suspect. Here he is in a police interview about it back in 2011. That's three years before his fishing trip prize. You know where he is, David? I honestly don't. The last thing you can do for Brett is to tell us where he is. I honestly do not know where he is. I have nothing to do with it. All that suspicion doesn't help David's business. Money's pretty tight anyway. He and his wife Helen have three kids. Helen's working part-time at McDonald's. It's sometimes a stretch paying for firewood. So this fishing trip is a godsend. David's picked up from home, driven to Wellington, taken out on the water. There's plenty of booze, something else David Little is into, and a swanky lunch complete with crayfish. He hits it off with one of the other prize winners, a bloke called Nick O'Neill. Nick even says he might have some work for him. David tells his family, perhaps not entirely tactfully, 
that it was the best day of his life. Then things get even better. Nick calls up and offers David that work. He picks up David in a Porsche. But it's not building work. As David does more and more jobs with Nick over the next few months, it becomes clear that the jobs he's doing a repossession, collecting money from sex workers, acting as a lookout for burglary, a big drug deal, are increasingly serious crimes. It's also clear that David is being auditioned for membership of a secret organisation headed by a mysterious and powerful man. And the payoff if he joins the organisation is huge. New friends, lots of easy money, a new car, free trips overseas. Nick becomes David's best friend. They go to bars, cafes, movies, even to Tapapa. They have long chats in the car. They talk about their families, the Kiwi Rugby League team, Royal Visit. Nick tells David about the importance of trust and honesty in the organisation. Back home, David's family are pretty excited. He doesn't tell them about the criminal side, but they know he's been away a lot with Nick. They know he's in line for a new job. They know it might change their lives. Helen's been worried about the toll that all that building work was taking on David's body. The kids start asking, did you get the job, Dad? Then the big day arrives. David's called to a meeting with the organisation's boss, whose name is Scott, in its posh apartment in Wellington. What, do you get the job? Nick gets him a new shirt, flash haircut, gives him a hug. He tells David, ready for this, mate? It's a life changer if it goes well. He'd been told before the interview, um, this is your big chance, this is your life-changing moment if you get the nod. And if he, if he got the nod, they're all going out for dinner at the flashest restaurant in town and then they're going for a big drinking partying weekend uh, to Australia, staying at five-star hotels with the um, females who'd been told in his uh, hearing not to bring their bikini tops. David wants in. He wants it badly. But first he's got to answer a few questions. See, Scott has connections. Scott's found out about the time three years ago the police thought David killed his friend, Brett Hall. David says, yeah, he disappeared and they thought I murdered him. Scott's worried that it might attract attention to his organisation. He wants to know if it's true. Maybe he can clean up any evidence that's still out there. But David says it wasn't him. He thinks Brett was killed in a drug deal. But it seems that Scott isn't satisfied with that answer. Scott says he reckons the police must have got it right. He says... I don't give a fuck if you knock this boy over. Couldn't fucking care less. My loyalty's not to him. It's to you, okay? Then David says, All right then. I'll tell you the truth. I did do it. Scott tells David he's in. He's got the job. But Scott just needs to make sure there are no loose ends that might come back on him. So next day, Scott and Nick drive David up to Manawatu, to show them where he says he buried the remains. After that, Scott and Nick take David to the Yellow House Cafe in Whanganui. They have a chat. Nick starts talking about the moon landing being fake. You can imagine how David's feeling, hanging out with his new friends, having just landed the job of his life. Then Scott and Nick excuse themselves and step outside. And David Little's world implodes. The police have arrested and charged a man with the murder of a man who disappeared three years ago. Next thing he knows, police officers walk in and arrest him. He's charged with the murder of Brett Hall, his friend who went missing three years ago. Scott, Nick, the whole organisation never existed. It was a police sting. And now David is on tape, confessing to murder. Meanwhile, police head out to dig up the remains. They find nothing. No body. No gun. No trace of Brett Hall. Did David Little kill Brett Hall? Was this really a confession? Is it possible that the police, by creating a fiction around David Little, had just invited him to invent his own scene inside it? Did David Little commit a murder? Or just become trapped in his own story about one? If I wanted anything done, Brett was there and... Um, he just, he'd helped me out. This is Brett Hall's mum, Lavona. Brett's the guy that David Little is accused of murdering. I needed a new freezer, so we went and got that. Um, he sort of organised all that and got it home. He was always sort of there with a helping hand, even as a young, well, uh, say, teenager. 
There are two stories you can tell about Brett Hall, who was 47 when he disappeared. Both of these stories are true, but neither of them is true on its own. In one story, the one his mum's telling us now, he's a good Kiwi bloke, grew up on a sheep farm, worked as a shearer and a barman, always ready to lend a hand, practical, likeable, good to his mum, willing to help out in the kitchen. When he was staying with me when his dad died, we, you know, he did all the cooking, what have you, and we had some lovely meals, all, you know, stews and all different things. Brett might have been handy in the kitchen, but Lavona says he was really an outdoors guy. A bit of fishing, eeling, mushrooming, sports, hunting. He even kept a little garden as a kid and dreamed of growing his own orchard of fruit trees. And when he grew up, he used to take his son Damien out into the bush, show him the ropes. And when Damien had kids, his son wanted his turn with Brett. He always wanted to go and stay at the farm with Grandad, so Brett would take him up there for a day or two and do all the things. There was Grandad, Grandad this, Grandad that. And Brett loved his grandkids. Oh, he adored them. Absolutely adored them. He was good to his mum too. Lavona was looking forward to staying with Brett once he'd built his dream home on his land up by the Whanganui River. Said to him, oh, one day I'd love to come up and stay at the farm, you know. And he said, Mum, there'll always be a bed for you up there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, how, that's how close we were. Very, very close here. But the other story about Brett is a bit of a darker one. He took up drug dealing. I don't know when that started. Maybe it was after his dad got killed in an explosion at his engineering firm. That hit Brett hard. He also started taking drugs himself. Still, the drug trade provided plenty of scope for Brett's resourcefulness. Here's Brett's son Damien describing how Brett transported drugs. I've taken this and some of the other voices you'll hear in the rest of this episode from what they said later in court. Yeah, he had a small clear tube, uh, about an inch in diameter, maybe six inches long, and he'd stuff the ounce into there, uh, tape it up at each end so it was well sealed, uh, and then he'd put it inside his fuel cap. So he'd take the fuel cap out of the Hilux, put this little tube in there, and there was a little baffle that would hold it and stop it from dropping into the tank. Michael, Brett's younger brother, says it got really dangerous sometimes. Oh, I think it might have been gang members came and basically knocked on the door, he opened the door, they barged in, had him at gunpoint, asking for money and drugs, I think it was. In 2005, the police caught up with him. A police raid on his home uncovered 60 grams of pee packed into little bags, 26 kilograms of cannabis, some ecstasy tablets and LSD, and $13,000 in small bills. Brett was convicted of drug dealing and a firearms crime. He was sentenced to seven and a half years in prison, but got out in four. He'd done a drug treatment program and was praised for his insights into his addiction, the risks he was running and the effects on his victims. One story you can tell about that is that he was canny enough to game the system because he was soon back to dealing when he got out. But it's possible that he was genuinely grappling with his future. His mum Lavona shows me a framed collage hanging on her wall that Brett made while he was in prison. I think it was just part of his rehab, you know, when he did that. It's a rural scene. There's a jeep, a stag, a nico tree and a farm gate all set on a striking green paddock. Uh, well, it's just sort of his life, I think, what he loved most, you know, being up on the farm. Overhead, though, the sky is grey and brooding. And right through the middle of the picture, curving up past a signpost sprouting pointers to various cities, and right up across the sky... Brett has painted a big, wide road. And at the top, the road splits. At the end of each, he's put a picture clipped from a magazine or a newspaper, and he's numbered them one and two. Between them, he's drawn a big question mark. I don't know what the question mark is, but... question mark there, it's like, hmm. where will my road take me? Yes, could be here. Both pictures show paths through the bush. It's difficult to work out what different destinies they're supposed to represent. The second one seems to be the righteous one, because Brett has drawn a rising sun with rays radiating from the top of the picture. Is it significant that the second path is straighter? It's also rockier, though. I never actually sort of got into it, what it was all about. But I love the the darkened sky as well. It's sort of... 
yeah. moody, isn't it? Yes, yeah. Whatever the case, it does seem like this is a man wondering how to plot the storyline of his life. You can see that picture yourself. It's on our website. When I look at it, what I can't help thinking is that the second picture at the end of the road, with its curved sunny top, looks uncomfortably like a tombstone. As we'll hear at the end of this episode, Brett disappears at the end of May 2014. He's never been found. What happened to him? Police say he was killed by David Little. David Little admitted it at the end of a Mr Big Sting. But now he says it's not true. He says Brett was killed in a drug deal gone wrong. Can we get any clues from what was going on in Brett's life before he went missing? I'm walking up the Pitangi track to take a look at the land that used to be Brett's up the top. It's been raining a bit, so you can hear the water streaming down the track. Ooh, she's a bit slippery. The bottom of the track, where I started out from, is about 30 kilometres from Whanganui, along the Whanganui River Road. It's not far from Jerusalem, where the poet James K. Baxter set up his community in the early 70s. Today, mist has settled over the water, giving it an airy feel. It's beautiful, but spooky. One of the locals told me, if you come across a skeleton up there, just kick it off the track. I think he was joking. They say sinkholes can open round here, big enough to swallow you up. Okay, I'm now at the top of the track. I'm at Brett's place. Oh, Brett's former place. The paddock of scrubby grassland up here is known as Kiwi Flat. Actually, there are no kiwi, and it's not quite flat. It's the size of three or four football fields, and it slopes gently down to the right as I'm looking at it. On the sides of the flat, there are pockets of native bush and some steep drops down to tangles of thick bush and gorse and gullies. Beyond that, Kiwi Flat is partly ringed by nearby ridges that stand stark against the sky. It's windswept, desolate, beautiful. There's a stillness, lots of space for thoughts. You can see why Brett loved it up here. It looks a bit like the pictures on his collage. Brett bought a share of Kiwi Flat after he got out of prison in 2009, two years before he disappeared. If you look to the right from where the Pitangi track comes out onto Kiwi Flat, you can still see the campsite Brett set up by some trees. The old caravan he slept in still there, and the brick fireplace beside it. He's built another shed further back. You can picture him back in 2011, just before he disappeared, cooking over the campfire, tossing bits of food to a magpie he liked to feed. He's medium build, just under six feet tall, probably wearing a black singlet and a check shirt, some black shorts and jandals. Parked nearby are his utes, a quad bike and a motorbike. Maybe he'll ride out and check his possum traps this evening, then pull out his telescope for a bit of stargazing. Or perhaps he'll go hunting. He's got a .22 and a .223 stashed by the long drop down the bank near the campsite. Though it's a bit risky since one of his parole conditions says he can't have guns. At some point, he'll probably look over toward the house he's having built up there. It's just a frame now, it's almost ready for the roof and cladding, windows and doors. He'd be thinking about that with satisfaction, but also frustration. It's his dream home, but it's taking ages to build. He's hired his best mate David Little to help him build it. Brett's nearest neighbour, a retired teacher called John Thurlow, who lives at the bottom of the Pitangi track, says he and Brett had a few run-ins, but generally Brett had settled in well and was a pretty good bloke. Brett once warned him when a dog attacked his sheep. You know, Brett was pretty uh, upfront, reasonably friendly, um, and he obviously knew what he's doing in terms of living in that area. Well, Brett wasn't being entirely upfront. True, he was trapping possums and selling fur, but this was really a story to cover for his drug dealing. He's got buckets of cash and drugs buried on the property. He carries a wallet full of bills too fat to come from sales of possum fur. In fact, just before Brett disappears, he tells his son Damien he's got a big drug deal coming up soon. And although he's presenting a clean image to his probation officers, his brother Michael says he's still taking drugs occasionally too. Maybe it's making him a bit paranoid. He had a feeling that somebody was watching him, you know, spying on him, hiding away and you know, just watching his activities. Brett also thinks John Thurlow stole $40,000 from him. He suspects things have been moved around in his caravan. He installs a camera on the track up to the campsite. And lately, he's been wondering whether David Little has been ripping him off. 
Brett met David Little about 20 years earlier. David was about a year younger than Brett. They got to be friends. Brett was the best man at David's wedding to Helen. Their families holidayed together in Nawi. By 2011, they're hanging round a lot together, mostly up at Pitangi. David Little is 46. He left school at 14, worked at a freezing works, then as a builder. He and Helen moved to Wellington for a while, but they've come back to Halcom, a little town just inland from Bulls. Brett lent David money to set up his building business, but now David's living paycheck to paycheck. It doesn't help that he's a very heavy drinker, maybe an alcoholic. Brett asked David to build him a house at Pitangi. He paid him $70,000 when it was done. He gave him about $20,000 up front to be used for materials. But things didn't progress as quickly as Brett wanted. There were problems with the legal title. Then David injured his shoulder and couldn't do any heavy work for months. Brett's mum, Lavona, remembers Brett getting annoyed at David dragging his heels. He was getting very angry about it because things... Dave would come up to the farm and just want to go hunting. Worse, Brett suspected David was overcharging him for materials and pocketing the difference. And buying inferior timber. And spending some of the money meant for windows and roofs on himself and his family. Brett demanded money back from David and started threatening to get another builder. But then they seemed to sort things out and David finished the frame. Just needed a tick from the building inspector. Then they could close the house up. But there was a possible problem looming. David hadn't bought the windows and Brett wasn't going to give him any more money. And Brett had a temper. Was David starting to sweat about what might happen when Brett found out? Then, Brett disappears. We need to zoom in on the seven days around Brett's disappearance. It's the end of May 2011. It's shortly after the tsunami in Japan and about a month after Prince William married Kate Middleton. I'm going to focus in on the week beginning the 26th of May 2011, a Thursday. I'll be calling those days the Thursday, the Friday, the Saturday and so on. It's worth paying attention now because we have to know what went on if we're to work out what happened to Brett. We'll be going over those seven days again in episodes to come, but for now, I just want to give you an outline of the basic things we know about them. On the Thursday, that's the 26th of May, 2011, David Little is up at Pitangi with Brett. He's been staying there to put the final touches on the house frame. The building inspector is due to arrive at 10am that day. But it's been raining and he hasn't quite finished. So on that Thursday, David rides out to the hilltop where he can get cell phone reception and cancels the building inspector. On the Friday morning, Brett's neighbour John Furlow sees David with Brett at the campsite. The prosecutors say David murdered Brett on Friday, sometime after John Furlow left. On the Saturday, Brett's son Damien and his friend visit Pitangi. Brett's not there, and the campsite looks a bit weird. The caravan doors open, rifle cases on the floor. They start looking for him, a bit worried. Eventually, they find Brett's quad bike up on a hill next to the bush. They figure Brett's gone possum trapping when they leave. On the Sunday morning, John Thurlow sees David Little driving up the Pitangi track toward the campsite. David says he saw Brett there, had a cuppa, did some work on the house frame. He says the quad bike was down at the campsite, and he says Brett told him he was going to go hunting. David leaves around 10am. That afternoon, a red ute with a trailer of wood is spotted driving from the bottom of the Pitangi track. And that evening, a white ute is seen there too. On the Tuesday, John Thurlow visits the campsite several times and Brett's not there. He calls the police. On the Wednesday, the police start a search. They figure Brett might have hurt himself hunting. Maybe he fell down a tomo, that's one of the sinkholes in the bush. Perhaps he's just done a runner. It turns into the biggest missing person search ever conducted in central districts. They find nothing. Search and rescue crews will this morning resume searching rugged terrain north of Whanganui, looking for a 47-year-old man who was last seen on Sunday. Police say they have growing concerns about Brett Hall, who lives in Palmerston North but owns a lifestyle block off River Road, north of Parakino. After 12 days of fruitless searching, police start suggesting that something much worse has happened to Brett. The police have quit their search for Brett Hall, who hasn't been seen for more than two weeks since going missing from his Whanganui lifestyle block. Detective Senior Sergeant David Kirby says the police believe Mr Hall's disappearance is not a random event and that he's been the subject of foul play. 
The police find meth utensils, cannabis, money and drug dealing paraphernalia in and around Brett's campsite. Suspicion turns to locals involved in drug dealing. Remember that Brett had told Damien that he was involved in a big drug deal that weekend? Was that how he was killed? But police also start to wonder about David Little. They interview him eight times. One of them is recorded. Can you understand that on the face of it, from where we are, that the circumstances of you being up at the farm gives us the impression that you in some way played a part in the disappearance of Brit? Oh, I think you could think that if you want to, yeah. But I'm a fact, I had nothing to do with it. But David struggles to answer some of the police questions. He'd been driving around in the early hours of the Sunday morning. Where did he go? Did he know more about Brett's guns than he was letting on? Did he really meet with Brett on the Sunday morning? Or had he staged the whole scene up at Pitangi, with the caravan open and the quad bike up the hill, just to make it look like Brett had gone hunting? But David's very cooperative, and although his story shifts, most of it seems like it could just be problems with his memory. Or maybe he's spinning us a story. Police think so, but they don't have enough evidence to make the case beyond reasonable doubt. The file slowly becomes inactive. Back in the day, that's where it might have been left. But now there's a new method to think about. An undercover sting that had worked before. An operation called Mr Big. Mr Little Meets Mr Big is an RNZ production, written and presented by me, Stephen Price, with support from Victoria University of Wellington and the Michael and Suzanne Boren Foundation. Justin Gregory and Katie Gossett are the executive producers. Tim Watkin is the executive producer of podcasts and series for RNZ. Thanks to sound engineers Blair Stagpool, Phil Benj, Mark Chesterman, Rangi Powick and William Saunders. Jeremy Ansel and Steve Burridge are the Auckland and Wellington operations team leaders. Music composed and performed by Ebony Lamb and Graham Antler. Images by Ebony Lamb. Artwork and design by Jared Bishop and RNZ. You can listen and follow all RNZ podcasts at Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you.